Okay, good morning everyone. Let's get started. <clears throat> Welcome to the last week of uh, classes at least, maybe not of the semester. Uh, this is our second last uh, class, so a couple housekeeping notes before we dive back in uh, to lecture. First one is a reminder to please, please, please fill out your course evaluations for this class. Um, despite what you might have heard, faculty do look at the course evaluations. We do try and absorb what you liked and what you uh, did not like about the course. We pay attention to your suggestions and I try my best to incorporate it into next year's class. So as a favor to the students who are going to take this class in years to come, please do fill out the course evaluation uh, and let me know uh, what could use some work. Fair? Okay. Uh, other housekeeping note is the final project explanation. Uh, as, a, as is mentioned briefly in the final project document, there are two final project documents, one for the grad students, one for the undergraduates. In both of those final project uh, documents, there's a brief mention that the night before, the night before our final exam period, you will be submitting your oral and written uh, summaries of your final project. Next time, Thursday morning, I will talk uh, in detail about what exactly you will be submitting the night before and what exactly you will be doing during the oral presentations. All right? Okay. Until then, uh, we will get back to our discussion of uh, Xenobots, the very final theme uh, in the class. So just as a reminder, we're in, uh, we're in this last segment of the course where we're looking at evolutionary algorithms that are tinkering with the physical structure and the neural controllers of our machines. And we've gone very briefly in a few lectures from the mid-90s, the actual first uh, demonstration that you could create AI that would optimize both bodies and brains of machines. We jumped forward to uh, the mid uh, 2010s and we looked at a project, in, uh, we looked at a couple projects in soft robotics in 2015, 2018, 2019. So we're catching up to the present day very quickly in these last few lectures uh, in the class. And so when you look back at robotics, you can sort of see these sort of three eras. Um, <laughs> Basically, since the end of the Second World War up until about the beginning of the 2010s, all of the robots that people were trying to make were made from steel, metal, ceramics, plastics, sensors, motors, all the typical things we tend to associate with robots, which now in retrospects is known as rigid robotics for obvious reasons. There is a fast growing uh, community around this idea of soft robots. Our ability to manufacture, and in some cases 3D print, um, increasingly exotic materials that have soft and rigid components um, is helping us to think differently about robotics. Uh, I showed you as inspiration last time the octopus, which was because it's soft, is able to deform its body and move through very small apertures. So there is now this second sort of era of robotics where there's an increasing focus on the materials from which the machines are made and looking at all the different kinds of materials that are now available for us to make our robots from. Today we're going to start talking about Xenobots which uh, uh, I've been involved with and is our attempt to sort of usher in a third era or a third approach to robotics where we're basically broadening the palette of materials from which an AI can design machines and this expanded palette is now going to contain living materials as well. So we have traditional rigid components from traditional robotics, uh, exotic inorganic materials like silicone, metal foams, uh, interesting things coming from material science, and now increasingly biological components as well. Yeah? Rigid robotics, soft robots, and what is now becoming known as biological robots. And that's what we're going to talk about today and Thursday to end off the class. Yeah? Okay, so here we go. All right, I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about the uh, origin story for uh, Xenobots. We talked about the evil starfish when we talked about resilient machines. Uh, this was something that I worked on uh, years ago, which was a demonstration of how do we evolve machines or give them some intelligence so that if something unexpected happens in their environment, 
or even more so if something unexpected happens to their body, they can find a way to adapt and carry on with whatever it is we want the robots to do. Yeah. Meanwhile, uh, some of my biology colleagues, uh, Doug Blackiston and Michael Levin, back in 2013, uh, published a paper which a lot of people found surprising at the time and still find surprising, which is somewhat related to the Resilient Machines Project in that in this case, the biologists are going to rearrange some living tissue in a living organism. And not only is this rearrangement not going to kill the organism, the organism is going to do perfectly fine with this rearrangement. So what are you looking at? You're looking at, uh, you're looking at a genetically modified tadpole. Um, it has been uh, genetically modified so that it does not grow eyes in the normal place uh, at the front of the head. So this is a genetically blinded tadpole. That's the first intervention or the first change that the biologists have made uh, to this particular organism. And they have also taken some eye precursor cells. This is a particular type of stem cell, which is destined to become or help develop the eyes of frogs, eye precursor cells. These eye precursor cells, as you can probably guess, in a normal developing uh, tadpole or frog would end up, uh, would start to appear at this part of the tadpole. They performed a surgical intervention where they introduced these eye precursor cells into the tail of the tadpole. Yeah. A pretty major intervention in the developmental trajectory of this organism. The way in which it grows from a single cell into the normal adult phenotype for this organism, which is an adult frog. Yeah. Not only did this intervention not kill the frog, but during development, as this tadpole grew into a frog, these eye precursor cells started to develop, as you can already see here, they're starting to develop into a normal frog eye. They sent out uh, neurons and synapses, known as neural processes. So there was uh, neural, neural circuits growing outward from the back of this developing eye that managed to attach to the spinal cord uh, of the frog and uh, establish uh, a connection. And when this tadpole grew into an adult frog, it had an eye on its butt. You gotta love science, putting frogs, uh, putting eyes on the butts of frogs. Gotta love science. This eye on the back of the frog was functional. The frog could use it to identify uh, prey, uh, sorry, not identify prey, but could identify uh, light and move away from light. So frogs tend to not like bright lights and move away from them. So exhibited photophobia, one of the default behaviors of this organism. Yeah. Throughout this course, obviously, we have not been talking about frogs. We've been talking about robots. I promised you we would talk about the ethics of robotics. Uh, obviously, now we are straying into ethically interesting uh, territory. So allow me to finish introducing you to xenobots, and we can then talk about the ethics of xenobots and the ethics of robotics in general. Fair? OK. All right. So. Uh, Mike Levin's lab working on the ways in which organisms are able to ch uh, deal with changes in their bodies and at the same time we were working on trying to create machines that could similarly adapt and carry on despite changes to their body. We knew about each other's work and back in about 2015 uh, we pitched a proposal uh, to DARPA which is the research wing of the Department of Defense, DARPA to bring these two ideas together to create machines that could, to create robots that could learn from how organisms do this to better do this. Yeah, that's what we pitched to DARPA. DARPA funded both of our labs. So we got together and we started to figure out how we could do something together where we could learn how organisms do this and use this to, allow, to create new machines that could do this better. Yeah. Uh, at the beginning of this interdisciplinary project, we had a bunch of computer scientists from my lab and a bunch of biologists from Mike's lab. Uh, Mike is at Tufts University. Uh, so this was now 2018. So we set up weekly Zoom calls where before we even got to the research, we needed to understand sort of each other's language. 
You've heard a lot of uh, you've heard a lot of specific terminology to robotics and evolutionary algorithms. Obviously, biologists have their own terminology, so we had to learn how to speak the same language. So, as part of those weekly meetings, we would lead one meeting, the biologists would lead the meeting the next week, and back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So, one week, my then PhD student Sam Kriegman showed the biologists this, which you saw last time. So, this was when we were starting to figure out how to simulate soft bodied robots, and Sam was demonstrating to our biology colleagues that, like in the Resilient Machines project, we could injure these machines in ways they've never been injured before and figure out ways to recover. The next week, when our, our biology colleagues were in charge of the Zoom meeting, Doug Blackiston, the microsurgeon, came in and showed us this image with no explanation. All of the act, there was complete silence on the call. People weren't quite clear about what we were looking at, but obviously somehow Doug had been inspired by what, by, what he, by what he'd seen the week before, and he had sat down to build it. What did he build it from? Some of you may be a little bit familiar with the Xenobots project already. What are we looking at here? Frog cells. Frog cells. So, Doug, uh, Doug is a microsurgeon who's very talented at being able to rearrange living tissue in living organisms. So he took inspiration from this and asked if he liberates cells from early frog embryo. We're looking at a tadpole here. Doug actually, you, what Doug usually does is to take uh, frog cells from basically a frog egg, very, very early embryo. It isn't even a tadpole yet. And in this case, he took those cells, pulled them all apart, and I'll show you some videos of this in a few minutes, and then pushed them back together again in a sculpture resembling the soft robot that we had showed him the week before. Yeah. Doug is a very talented microsurgeon, doesn't drink coffee, doesn't drink Coke, no caffeine, has got very steady hands. It's like a, a world-class concert uh, violinist. Very, very steady hands. And as, again, as you'll see in the videos in a moment, with very, very small instruments, he takes individual cells and can put them together in new forms like you see here. This particular sculpture uh, is built only from a particular cell type from frog, which is frog skin cells, or actually skin precursor cells. He took stem cells from fro early frog embryo, and those stem cells are fated to become skin. So passive and soft, yeah? No muscle here at all. So this is not a robot, this is a sculpture. You'll notice, or maybe you can tell, it's floating in some fluid here. Individual frog skin cells, like frogs themselves, are happiest in about room temperature fresh water. So what we're looking at is uh, Doug looking through the microscope into a Petri dish. That Petri dish is filled with more or less room temperature fresh water. And the magnification here is uh, such that we're looking at something that's about a millimeter across. So if you were to look into the Petri dish at this point in time, you'd see something that looks like a speck of pepper. Okay, people typically have questions already at this point. Questions? Um, like, why exactly did he do that? Like, why, why did he do it? Because like, it's not going like, to do the same thing as like, the robot. Absolutely. So at this point, we weren't even working on any research yet. We didn't have a specific question in mind. We were just trying to understand what each group was, was capable of. So we were showing that we could simulate soft-bodied creatures, we could injure or rearrange the parts that made up that machine, and the machine, meaning the evolutionary algorithm that's designing the machine, could find a way to recover. Doug similarly was showing off that he could do this. He could take something that we showed him and actually build it, at least at this point, build it from genetically unmodified frog skin cells. So why did he do it? Just to demonstrate that it could be done. Other questions? What questions do you think we had? The, the evolutionary roboticists on the call. 
You kind of already alluded it to it. Yeah, like does it do anything? Does it do anything? It doesn't do anything, it's a sculpture, it just floats there. What do you think our next question was? Could you do it again so it would be stuck? Could you do it again so that it would no longer be a sculpture but it would be a robot? Can you get this thing to move? Doug's, Doug thought about said, tricky, but possibly. So after a few months uh, of work uh, on this, Doug figured out that he could liberate two cell types from early frog embryo, uh, the skin cells that we just talked about, and frog heart muscle cells, otherwise known as myocardiac tissue. Myocardiac tissue or myocardiac uh, cells. These are uh, special types of muscle cells that form into a frog heart. Your myocardiac tissue, if all goes well during development, forms into a functioning heart. Human and frog myocardiac tissue have, uh, or those cells have a particular property, which you will, they, they will spontaneously increase and decrease in volume. Where have we seen that recently? Simulated um, like inflating, deflating things like the, the voxels here. So I put this up for all of us to view. So last time we talked about some work from Professor Cheney back when he was a PhD student in 2013, when he was uh, flexing voxcads, uh, voxelizes muscle, voxelize being this brand new this brand new uh, simulator that simulated soft materials by representing them as voxels. And in uh, Nick's early work, he created different kinds of voxels. And in the videos I showed you last time, he had red and green voxels that would spontaneously increase and decrease in volume. Yeah, great. OK, so we're starting to build a bridge between the biology and what we can do with evolutionary algorithms and physics engines. So far, so good? Okay, so frog and human myocardiac uh, cells, the cells themselves increase and decrease in volume. During human development and during frog development, those cells migrate and move around and link up into a particular configuration. And then those cells talk to one another in a particular way so that they all say increase in volume, decrease in volume, increase in volume, and they all increase and decrease their respective cell volumes in sync with one another, which is very, very important because that causes the frog heart or the human heart to increase in volume as a whole and decrease in volume as a whole, which is what allows your heart to act as a pump and pump blood in and out uh, of the heart. There is a very uh, common uh, cardiac pathology that happens in older uh, human adults, which is known as uh, AFib or atrial fibrillation, which is that somehow the way in which the cell, the uh, myocardiac cells in the human heart communicate with one another, that communication starts to break down and the cells start to desynchronize. One part of the heart gets bigger at the same time that another part of the heart gets smaller, which means the ability for the heart to act as a pump starts to break down. Yeah? Not a good thing to have happen to you. Okay, this is a fair bit of a digression, but we're gonna come back to why this is important uh, in a few minutes. So far, so good? Okay, so Doug told us that uh, about six months into the project, uh, we, as the roboticists, or the AI, had two building blocks at its, disposal, at its disposal. Small things, which are passive and soft, they can be pulled and pushed by neighboring cells, these are the frog skin cells, and other types of cells that are going to spontaneously get bigger and smaller on their own. Yeah? In the video you're about to see, the video you saw, sorry, in the video you saw uh, last time, each, uh, the, the color scheme was light blue is passive and soft. We're going to stick with that. Last time we had red and green voxels. 
which also increased and decreased in size, but they did it in antiphase with one another, right? That was what the green and the red represented. In the videos you're gonna see today, you're gonna see just two types, but you're gonna see three colors. In the heart cells, when the heart cells are getting bigger, they're gonna, they're gonna turn more green, and as those cells are getting smaller in volume or decreasing in volume, they're gonna get redder. Yeah, okay. So, what we did was we took Nick's approach, we took hypermeat, and remember that hypermeat is a particular kind of evolutionary algorithm that involves populations of CPPNs. Here is one CPPN, a compositional pattern producing network. And this composition, this, this particular CPPN has been modified so that it constructs an arbitrary 3D geometry inside an empty cage and then paints uh, in Nick's original work, paints one of four integers onto the voxels. Red, green, light blue, or dark blue. Yeah. The only modification we made to Nick's work is uh, we scaled this back so that the second output neuron in the CPPN can only paint one of two integers, skin or myocardiac. So far, so good? Questions? Okay, off we go. So what you're looking at here is the phenoty three phenotypes produced by three CPPNs in the initial hyperneat population. Remember in generation zero of all evolutionary algorithms, you have random things. In our case, we have random CPPNs, and here are the first three random CPPNs producing random phenotypes. Hopefully you can see, uh, if you look carefully, you'll notice that the red-green voxels, uh, the voxel, the red voxels are getting greener when they get bigger and redder when they get smaller. You'll notice that this isn't a random spray of, uh, of voxels. There's pattern here, which is just a reminder that random CPPNs, the CPPNs themselves were designed so that even random CPPNs tend to produce non-random patterns. You can see that here in that you get contiguous patches of the two different cell types. We don't get skin, skin, cell, uh, skin, skin, myo, skin, myo, skin, myo, there's patches here. There's even a little bit of radial symmetry already uh, in the population, right? This is the nice thing about CPPNs. Okay. You'll notice another detail here about the red-green voxels. What is it? They're all in like different phases. They're all in different phase with one another. So in Nick's work from last time, he had red and green voxels that were hard-coded to be in antiphase with one another. Yeah. Here, in this video, you'll notice that every individual myo cell in the simulation has a different phase offset. They're all getting bigger and smaller at the same frequency, but they all have a random phase offset. This is an important detail and has to do with what we were just talking about uh, as follows. When uh, Doug told us that he could liberate myocardiac cells and he could put them together in different patterns other than uh, default frog heart, the pattern that they're used to being in, we had to figure out what phase offset. How should we, how should we simulate these cells? Should we simulate them as all being in sync with one another? So we asked Doug, the microsurgeon, what happens when you re rearrange myocardiac tissue? Do they figure out that they're in a new shape and still figure out how to synchronize and all increase and decrease in volume together? Or do they just not know what to do and they start uh, increasing and decreasing at random phase offsets to one another? Do they fail to synchronize? And Doug's answer was, I don't know, nobody's tried this before. So the design decision we made at that point was to make things hard on the evolutionary algorithm is basically assume the worst. That no matter what rearrangement the uh, hyperneat dictates for the myocardiac cells, 
they will assume they don't communicate, they don't know what to do, they just increase and decrease volume at their own phase. They're independent of anyone else. Yeah? So we've seen this sort of theme many times now in this course, some sort of subtle design detail or something that's beyond sort of human intuition. So we just turn things over to the evolutionary algorithm. Evolution tends to be smarter than human beings, so let's make things hard on the evolutionary algorithm and see what it can do. So our immediate next question, once we started up HyperNeat here and started evolving these, is could, could HyperNeat find a way to evolve the physical structure of these machines so that we get non-random behavior? As always, we're going to evolve these things to locomote or move as quickly as possible, uh, in this case, to the right. Yeah? So the HyperNeat, HyperNeat has a pretty difficult task in front of it. It's got to create a reliable machine, something that reliably moves to the right, out of unreliable parts. Unreliable in the sense that they don't synchronize. Yeah? Any questions so far? OK. So off we go. Oh, another observation to make is we're starting to stray quite a bit now from most of the evolutionary robotics experiments you've seen in this course. There's no neural controller here, right? Now we're not just evolving bodies and brains here. We're only evolving bodies, no brains. Yeah. OK. First attempt, uh, what you're looking at here is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten times ten. You're looking at a hundred evolved xenobots. These are the most fit xenobots from a hundred runs of HyperNeat. We ran this a hundred times, and we found the fastest moving robot at the end of each of those one hundred runs. What happened? Do you see any blue voxels here? What happened? It's the same thing with the other experiment, or um, it ended up being that like if you have a thing that moves, um, and that's like you just have like a pile of muscle, that just ends up being the fastest. Absolutely. So HyperNeat very quickly got rid of all the light blue voxels, which are the skin cells, passive and soft says, all you want me to do is move as quickly as possible to the right. Best way to do that is to form up into a ball uh, of muscle. Yeah? I'm not going to play any of these videos because this was, uh, this was a failure. We took these 100 <laughs> robots and we showed them to Doug, the microsurgeon, and we said, can you please build some of these? He said, I can't. I can't build with just myocardiac tissue. We said, oh, how come? He said, it's difficult to explain, but uh, it's not possible. There needs to be some support material in there. I need, I need some combination of the skin and heart muscle. The skin is almost like a scaffold or support. Yeah? OK. He said, even if I built it, this big ball of muscle, it's probably, they're not going to move like that. This is, Doug knew enough, even before trying to cross to real, that none of these sims would cross the sim to real gap. Yeah? So at that point, we said, OK, so you need some amount of skin and heart muscle. How much skin to muscle, or sorry, how much skin to myo do you actually need? He sort of thought about it and came up with about 50%, more or less, 30 to 50%. So he gave us a bunch of constraints about what he could and couldn't build and what the cells could and couldn't do. We took those constraints and we went back and we built them into HyperNeat and we ran everything again. How do you think we incorporated those constraints into, uh, into HyperNeat to run it again? HyperNeat is now not allowed to build with too much muscle. It has to use some skin. How do you think we incorporated that into HyperNeat? Things that use too much muscle got zero fitness. Absolutely, right? So we modified the fitness function so that now it would uh, obey the constraint. So if it strayed beyond the constraint, roll it back or delete it 
and move on. So what you saw was a failed sim to real attempt. We didn't even really make it to real. Back to sim. Now we're going to go forward to real. Yeah. Okay. So just wanted to pause here for a moment. Everything we've seen in this course about sim to real has assumed sim, then real, then we're done. Yeah. As robotics tends to, is starting to progress and we've got these more exotic materials to work with, uh, what we're finding is that it's not sim to real, it's sim to real to sim to real to sim to real to sim to real. The failure to cross the sim to real gap is often just as valuable, if not more valuable, than success. Because it means our simulation is wrong somehow. There's some detail of, in this case, the cells or the materials or the physics engine that we got wrong. And our failure is telling us something and might be able to guide us back to where things are wrong or inaccurate in the physics engine, in the simulation of the cells, the silicone, and so on. Yeah? OK. OK, so we took. We did an, uh, another 100 runs of Hypernate, so now we've done 200 runs of Hypernate. This kept the supercomputer over in South Burlington busy for a couple of months. This is what we got at the end. <laughs> Crossed our fingers, asked Doug, the, black, uh, Doug the, mic, uh, the microsurgeon, can you build any of these? We didn't hear back from him for a while. Eventually he emailed back, yes, I think I can build a few of these. In the end, he ended up building, being able to build five of these. Most of these he could look at and immediately know that he couldn't build them, which left him with about 20 or so. And then he sort of played around a little bit with some cells in a dish and narrowed this down to five. And at the end of that process, we boiled this down basically to a flow chart. So imagine we do evolution and we, uh, we do a whole bunch of runs of evolution and get this. We're going to take each of these 100 machines and push it through a flow chart and hope that some of the, we're going to start up here, we're going to hope that some of these uh, designs end up in this part of the flow chart. So it's okay if you can't read the text in the back. We're going to start here. First question is a yes or no question. Is the simulated design, does this robot, for example, is it made up of contiguous tissue regions? So we have to have big bunches of myo and big bunches of cell. We can't have myo cell, skin cell, myo cell, skin cell, myo cell. Doug is talented, but not that talented. He can't place individual cells where Hyperneat might want him to place individual cells. He can kind of scrape together bunches of cells, bunches of skin cells, bunches of myocells, cells, and sort of put them next to one another. Yeah? So if the answer to this is no, can't be built. If there's an individual or a pair of myocells cells surrounded by skin cells or vice versa, can't be built, fail to cross him to real gap. We didn't even get to real. Yeah? If the answer is yes, we go on to the next question. Is this a stable geometry? In the case of frog cells, what that means is that if there's any gaps inside the design, uh, let me see if I can zoom in on this for you. If there's any gaps or internal holes in the design, here's a, here's a gap or a concavity. These gaps or concavities have to be significantly big. If there is a one voxel diameter hole through the body of the Xenobot, he can't build it. It's got to be a big enough hole or concavity in order to pass uh, this second question. Anybody, any biologists here? Anybody know why small concavities or small holes are not OK here? Or they won't work? You won't be able to realize them in the physical design? Cells generally are social creatures. They don't like to be on their own. Depending on how many neighbors they have, they will kind of move or pull and push and reach out for other neighbors and pull those other neighbors towards themselves. Generally speaking, cells like to form up into spheres. They like to minimize the surface area to volume ratio. Generally speaking, that's sort of a safe place for groups of cells to be. 
the genetics of every species that isn't a ball, and there are lots of species out there, especially small animals that are balls of cells. Those of us that are not balls of cells, our, gen our DNA is working hard against that general tendency of cells to form up into balls of cells. So Doug made a few drafts. He, he made a few attempts where he carved out little concavities or little holes, and they would gradually seal back up again. Cells didn't like it. Yeah, so con small concavities, small holes are out. Big concavities, big holes. The cells seem to sort of give up and not try and form up into a ball. That's what we mean here by a stable geometry. Yeah. So if we have a simulated xenobot that has only contiguous t tissue regions and it's got a stable geometry, we go on to the third question, which is, is it mostly passive tissue? I apologize, I misspoke two minutes ago. Designs should have at least 50% passive tissue, at least 50% skin. You should be able to see at a glance that a lot of the designs here have less than 50% skin. Even when we penalize the designs for having too much skin, evolution still tries to get rid of them because we're selecting for locomotion, fast locomotion, and a good way to do that is to be a big ball of muscle. Yeah? Okay, so, uh, so what we have in this table over here, we have a ranked list of all of the robots. Here's the best robot from Run90. It happened to be the fastest moving robot. Now the 90th one is, uh, where is that? Down, uh, this one, down here. This was the fastest moving Xenobot, but it failed, uh, it failed uh, condition B1 and also happened to fail condition B3, so we wrote it in red. It's not going to real. It failed to make it across these barriers. We keep going down, and the 15th fastest Xenobot among all of these uh, did pass all of these tests. So Doug said, that's it. I'm going to try and build this particular design. So far, so good. Any questions? OK, this one. This is the one that Doug is, was going to try and build. OK, so let's see what that particular robot does uh, in simulation. As I already mentioned, you'll notice that all the myo cells here are uh, out of phase with one another. We have these randomly acting sort of muscles or motors in uh, the bottom part of the robot, the ventral part of the robot. So Hypermeat has evolved this solution where it's placed all of the actuators on the bottom or ventral part uh, of this machine, and it's put skin on the top. Uh, on the top or the dorsal part, dorsal part of the Xenobot. And I, we should have, when we created this video, drawn a trajectory uh, so you can actually see the movement of this robot. You'll have to trust me, the trajectory is more or less straight. Not exactly straight, but it's definitely not a random walk. How? How is this machine managing to walk forward in a more or less straight line, even though its motors or its muscles are all out of phase with one another. They're all, they all have random phase offsets from one another. Is it symmetric? So the symmetry is helping, so it's bilaterally symmetric here, always a good idea for locomotion. That helps, but it's not enough. Because it's tilted, so all of the yeah, you'll notice it's tilted forward. So all of the in, all of the linear forces, as these as the ventral voxels get bigger and smaller, they're pushing against each other or pushing against the ground, which is pushing it forward. So that's good. We have something that's bilaterally symmetric and heading in the right direction, but it could still trace a wandering or a random walk in that direction. Also helpful, but not sufficient. What else is going on here? Is it stable? Uh, it, is, it is stable, yeah. Yeah, 
the, the, the dorsal material, the passive material on the top is helping, but how is it helping? We've got randomly acting motors, but a non-random walk, something that's moving more or less in a straight line. How is the soft passive material on the top half of the robot helping? It's kind of like, almost like falling, like the, the, it's like on a slope. So like if, if it's like kind of directing the motion. It is, it is directing the motion. The skin cells, the blue voxels, are collectively directing all of the random forces coming up from below, from the ventral part. How? Thinking about thinking is misleading and also sometimes really, really hard and non-obvious. It's a li little difficult to see. It took us a while to figure this out. The soft cells on the top, they're kind of passively absorbing all of the forces, but they're absorbing energy. The energy doesn't just disappear. It's got to go somewhere. So the passive tissue seems to be almost like averaging all of the forces that are coming in and combining it and somehow smoothing it out to allow for this forward motion. <laughs> That's about the most technical description I can give you because beyond that, our intuition kind of runs, runs out. You'll remember when we talked about bipedal locomotion, we talked about passive dynamic walking. This is some sort of form of not passive dynamic walking, but hybrid dynamic walking. We have things that are exerting forces and other things that are passive, that are absorbing forces, combining them, propagating those forces onward to other voxels and so on. It's almost like, a, it seems like kind of a smoothing function. Yeah. Okay, a very non-obvious solution. If you asked an engineer or a synthetic biologist to sit down and make a machine that walks using skin and myocells, they, they probably wouldn't have come up with this. Yeah. Okay, all right, so that's sim. Let's switch to real. We're gonna watch 10 short videos here that are, uh, that are the sequence showing Doug building, uh, building this design, yeah? Okay, first step, he's going to take, uh, he's going to take uh, um, um, a, reporter, uh, a reporter material, which he's injecting into frog cells, and they're gonna stain the two cell types that he wants. He wants skin stem cells, and he wants myocardiac skin cells, uh, uh, stem cells. All the other types of cells that are destined to become eye and intestine and brain, he doesn't want, right? So he's basically, he's doing something to the eggs so that the eggs are gonna fluoresce a particular color to tell him where he can harvest the material that he needs. Okay. Step two, he's removing the vitaline membrane, the sort of gunk that grows on the surface of a cell. This is not a biology class. I'm not a biologist, so gunk is the best we can do here. Basically removing unwanted material from around the cell. There's a lot of stuff here, uh, sorry, in the egg here. He's removing a lot of stuff from the frog egg that's unnecessary for the construction of the xenobots. What you're gonna see him do now is scrape or cut off the cap or the top part of an egg. This is the part that would have originally, would have grown into an adult frog. The rest is yolk and other materials. He's taking the animal part, the animal cap, the animal part of the egg for construction. Remember that each of these, uh, in this case, the cell itself is also, a, uh, sorry, the egg itself is about a, a millimeter across. Imagine reach, looking through a microscope and having instruments in which you're trying to carve or manipulate a poppy seed. That's what you're watching. No caffeine in these experiments. Steady, steady hands. Okay, so what you're looking at now in this frame are two removed animal caps. Oh, sorry. 
two removed animal uh, caps, and he's removing the ectoderm, the outer part of the skin, which is unwanted. And underneath are the skin cells that he's after, which you can now start to see. These are the, the very small white uh, spheres that you see. These are individual frog skin cells. We are not going to see in these videos the liberation of the myocardiac tissue. This is just the harvesting of one of the two building blocks that Doug's going to work with. Questions at this point? Comments? Okay. So he's removed or isolated frog skin cells, which is what he wants to now try and reconstitute into different uh, forms and functions. So he's now going to, he's now, uh, he's now at this point, I'm skipping over a little bit. He sucked up all of those frog skin cells into a very small syringe, and he's now ejecting those frog skin cells into a very small well. So we're looking down through the microscope at the bottom of a petri dish, and in the bottom of that petri dish is a little cave, a little concave uh, well, and the cells are kind of pooling into that. Uh, into that pothole, yeah? Uh, I think this is more of the same. Yeah, okay. All right, so now these frog skin cells are sitting in this well. They're pretty surprised, right? This is not their normal experience as they develop into a frog cell. You'll notice that I've also switched to anthropomorphic language. You remember Valentino Breitenberg and the vehicles, the vehicles love, the vehicles hate. We can argue about whether the cells are actually surprised or scared. Whatever language we want to use, this is what they do. They seem to, quote unquote, not like to be on their own. They, the individual cells are moving and connecting with their neighbors and pulling. They are trying to form back into something. My biology colleagues refer to this as rebooting multicellularity. Frogs are multicellular organisms, so the cells that make up a multicellular organism, they tend not to like to be on their own. Yeah? So when in doubt, as a cell, it seems, find some neighbors, link up, and pull, so you're trying to form back up into a ball of cells. Okay. Here it is sped up a little bit more with, with more skin cells. You can see them pulling inward and compacting and doing something. One of the interesting things about making robots out of living materials, rather than making them out of inorganic materials, is that the materials themselves have a mind of their own. They have ideas about what they do and don't want to do. Okay. So what, what you just saw was liberation and then sort of reforming of the skin cells. What you're watching in this video is actually Doug building this original sculpture, not the one with myocardiac tissue. I'll just leave this. Let me speed this up a little bit. Doug is reaching in with a micro cauterization device now. It's a very hot wire. It's like a cigarette lighter and burning away some of the unwanted material. So he's got basically a sphere of skin cells at this point, and he's using tools to remove the unwanted material. There's a reason why we refer to this particular thing as a sculpture. Like most sculptors, you just remove unwanted material until you have your sculpture. Okay, so you're watching a bunch of videos from the sort of uh, xenosculpture construction process. When Doug makes xenobots out of skin and myocardiac tissue, um, when, we, when we did this experiment, this, uh, what Doug was able to do is put down a thin layer of skin cells, like you just saw in the previous videos, then layer on top of it a layer of myocardiac cells, on top of that, skin, 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 myo, myo, skin, myo. So basically putting down layers, like making a sandwich, and then at the end, scraping away the material. 
Yeah. So again, Doug can't place individual cells exactly where Hyperneat wants them to be placed. He can get close through this layering followed by subtraction process. Questions? Okay. Okay. And in this last video here, you can see Doug coming in and scraping away, making a little uh, fine-tune fine adjustments to, to the design. Okay. Now we've got our uh, Xenobot. Uh, we're going to take it and turn it upside, uh, put it right side up again, so that the uh, so that the myocardial tissue is on the ventral side and the skin cells are on the dorsal side. And here's what we got. You'll notice that the physical vi video is sped up four times. but we seem, at least anecdotally, in this single video to have crossed the sim to real gap. The physical Xenobot doesn't look exactly like the simulated one. It's not perfect, but it seems to be close enough that it tends to walk to the right along the bottom of the Petri dish. Remember, it's suspended in, in room temperature, fresh water. So this is kind of like walking along the bottom of a swimming pool mostly buoyed up by the water, but walking along the bottom. Yeah. Okay, how do, we, how, do we know, how do we not know that we just got lucky in this case and that this thing just happened to move to the right, but not because Doug got all the details right? Maybe the dish is tilted to the right, or there's something else that's causing this thing to move to the right. We need to perform a control experiment, something where we remove what are known as the confounds, the other things, confounds, the other things that might explain why it's moving to the right. The other things that might be confounding our hypothesis that this thing is moving to the right because it instantiates or embodied the AI, the AI's design. Yeah? Any ideas here? Some of you are trying to do this with your own A-B tests, remove confounds. How do we try and prove to ourselves and to all of you that it's because of this design that it's walking to the right, not because, for example, the Petri dish is tilted to the right? If you're stumped, that's okay. It took us a while to sort of figure it out as well. When we figured it out, it was one of those things where you sort of kick yourself that in retrospect it was obvious. Take the Xenobot, flip it upside down. Right? It's the same Xenobot, but now it's got a different 3D geometry, and it's got a different distribution of cell types. If that thing also walks to the right, there's a confound. Something is causing these things to move to the right, regardless of what their geometry is or the distribution of cells inside. Make sense? Okay. So. Uh, you're going to see in the next video, it's not this particular Xenobot, but it's the Xenobot. This Xenobot is built from the same design that's moving to the right. Take this Xenobot, flip it upside down. This is what happens. Okay, so that's it. At least for this specific sim to real attempt, it is the geometry and the cell distribution that's getting it to cause, causing it to move to the right. So we declared victory here. This was the first AI-designed organism, something that does what we want, but is not, obviously not frog. It's not a result of natural evolution. It's a result of an AI. OK, I will pause here. Questions, comments? Why did you like want to have like a skin cell instead of like any type of uh, like other material? Yep. They don't like have a functionality. Like uh, it's see, well, good question. We asked that we as the computer scientists asked the same question. It turns out in retrospect that they definitely do have they do have a purpose. We didn't know that going into it, but at this point, that's what Doug could do. Doug could work with skin cells and myocardiac cells. That's it. 
today, we published this paper three years ago. Now, Doug can work with many more cell types, and that work is now underway. As you can probably imagine, we are now exposing our evolutionary algorithm and the physics engine to more cell types, more building blocks to see what it can do with different cell types. None of that work has been published yet, so I can't go into any details about that for now. Other questions? Okay. This is great, but it's anecdotal evidence, right? This is one attempt. So we wanted to collect some data on this. Here's our simulated uh, Xenobot, and here's our physical Xenobot. Uh, luckily for us, the, pa the, panel, uh, the panels are called A and B. This actually is an A-B test. We took our simulated Xenobot and we ran it many times in voxelized. So this is after evolution. No more evolution, just run the same evolved creature multiple times in the physics engine and watch how it moves. And that's what the pink trajectories represent. We're looking down in this panel C, we're looking down on top of the simulated Xenobot. And here's rightward motion here, we've got X on the horizontal axis and Y position on the vertical axis. Why does the same design, when played back multiple times, produce different trajectories? Why doesn't it produce identical trajectories every time we simulate it? Because in the real world, there's like more like compounding factors and like the motion that's making is kind of like really vulnerable to that. In the real world, yes, there are a lot of things going on. Man never enters the same river twice, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the case in simulation. Um, I'm thinking the word, but the rate at which the cell is expanding and contract differs. Absolutely. So it's not the, the rate at which they increase and decrease differs. It's not the frequency. It's the phase offset. Yeah. So every time we start a simulation of this creature, we, go, we visit each of the, and I apologize for the change in color scheme here, we visit each of the myocardiac cells on the ventral side of the organism, and we give it a random phase offset, and then start the simulation. Yeah? This is like you setting the synaptic weights in the neural controller for your robot, and then letting it loose. If you, mul if you simulate the quadruped multiple times, but set different synaptic weights at the beginning of each simulation, you're gonna get different behavior. Right? Same thing here, except there's no synapses. You know, that's the phase offset. Generally speaking, you can see that these pink trajectories move the simulated xenobot to the right. Yeah? Okay. Doug took this particular xenobot that he built carefully and put it right side up in the dish and let it move, and that produced some of the blue trajectories that you see here. Eventually, this xenobot died, so he made he built a second copy of this design, put it back in the dish, and caused it to uh, and watched how it moved again. So the blue trajectories are actually a collection of I don't remember. I think it might have been three or four different xenobots, but they're all built from the same design. I mentioned that the xenobots die. What do, what do I mean? How can a xenobot die? The cells like break down and stop working. The cells break down and, and stop working, right? If you scrape your thumb and a little bit of your skin tissue comes off, those skin cells continue functioning for a few days in some cases, and then eventually they just die and rot away into the background biota. Same thing with xenobots, yeah? Okay. You'll notice that both the pink, and the, the, uh, the pink and the blue trajectories tend to move to the right. And as I just showed you in the control experiment, the movement to the right is due to their geometry and cell, cell type distribution throughout the body. So this was our attempt to prove sim to real. Here's the control. We took the simulated xenobot, flipped it on its back, and simulated it multiple times in voxelize and got the pink trajectories. We took the physical xenobots, the three or four that Doug was able to build, put them on their back, 
and they similarly did not move to the right. So these two set, uh, data sets together were our proof in our paper that we were able to cross the sim to real gap for evolved biological robots. Questions? So you said that before he made the actual robot, he didn't know what would happen with like, the phases of the um, uh, my whatever. Yep. Um, what ended up happening with that? Uh, he was not able to image individual myocardiac cells and actually like extract the phase offsets, but generally speaking, they don't synchronize. Yeah. If you did, what you would have seen in this video is something that looked like a balloon, something that was getting bigger and smaller. It would have basically looked like a heart, right? That's not what you see. You see something that's rocking back and forth. One part of the body is getting bigger, while another part of the body is getting smaller, and vice versa. So as I mentioned, this is not sort of a traditional robot. No sensors, no motors, no neural controller, no joints. Where's the power coming from? There's no battery here either. How are these cells? How is this thing moving? What's the power source? There's only skin cells and there's only myocardiac cells. The myocardiac cells are getting bigger and smaller. They need power and energy to do so. Where is it coming from? Food, absolutely. What food? Where is that food coming from? Remember that these cells were taken from frog egg. When you were a bunch of cells in an egg, what, what was on the menu for you? What was your food? The yolk, absolutely. So at the particular point in development that Doug harvested these cells from the frog uh, the frog egg, these cells have ingested uh, yolk platelets. They've, they've sucked into, the, into themselves small bits of the yolk, and that's the battery. They're ingesting, they're metabolizing that yolk in order to do what they do. And in the case of these xenobots, at the moment, they tend to, to live for about seven to 10 days. By live, we mean that they remain motile, and after seven to 10 days, they stop moving, they've run out of gas, they've run out of yolk, and they start to rot back into the background biota. They just start constantly moving for seven to 10 days, but they never stop? They never stop, right? There's no, as far as we know, there's no neural controller here. There's no on and off button. They just do what they do, yeah? Other questions? Okay. So we published this work in gen uh, questions. Um, so just the muscle, like the muscle cells would become the heart cells. Like, did they ever like, it, like speed up and slow down? Like, was there ever kind of like a resting period? Or, you know? uh, great question. It's, it's possible that they had a heart rate, but we didn't see evidence of that. It's a good question, actually. I should ask Doug, but I, I think not. I think it was general constant motion. And then towards the end of their lifetime, they started to slow down and become non-motile, non-moving. So far, so good? OK, so, uh, so Sam, my PhD student, uh, in November 2019, he brought the video I just showed you and this data. And as a scientist, most of the time, nothing is working. And most of you with your final project probably have the same experience, right? Nothing works, nothing works, nothing works. Every once in a while, something starts to work. This is one of those rare moments when not only was it working, but we were seeing something that no one had been able to achieve before. And Sam was showing this to me during the Thanksgiving break. So we were here in innovation. Things were very, very quiet. And I just went for a walk along the halls and sort of absorbing that this was possible. You could cross the sim to real gap with biological machines. It's a very exciting uh, moment. And then we went back to more experiments that failed, 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 failed. Such is, such is the life of life in science. OK, so November 19, these were the results we got. We submitted this to a journal. And this work was published in January 2020. And as you can imagine, when you make uh, AI-designed frog bots, 
that are funded by the Department of the Defense tends to get the media's attention. So we spent uh, the next few months talking to CNN, BBC, and, and the New York Times, until in March 2020, another little creature came along and steal, stole the, uh, the limelight away from us. Okay, just for fun, here's uh, our friend Stephen Colbert explaining Xenobots. An African clawed frog embryo. <laughs> to make them reproducing robots, researchers using AI and a supercomputer took stem cells from African clawed frog embryos and formed them into tiny living creatures called xenobots, which were able to move on their own, communicate amongst each other, and heal themselves from an injury, making them the first ever living robots. Which is when researchers bulldozed the lab dropped flash grenades into the rubble, and went back to their first love, stand-up comedy. What's that? No? They kept going? Sweet. Then the xenobots would move around their environment and find single cells. They would gather hundreds of these cells at once and then assemble an offspring inside their mouth. A few days later, the offspring became a new xenobot. And that's when researchers doused the building in jet fuel, walked away from the smoking ruins, and took up selling driftwood sculptures on the beach. No, still making them puke robot babies? Super do. As one of the exper experts working on the project, Josh Bongard put it, we found xenobots that could walk. We found xenobots that swim. And now in this study, we found xenobots that kinematically replicate. What else is out there? A beach? A pocket knife? And your imagination. Please just think about it. We'll be right back. Okay, I'm thinking about it. I'm not gonna, I, I've tried uh, sculpting from driftwood, I'm not very good at it. We didn't carpet bomb the lab, at least not yet. So on we go. As our good friend Stephen Colbert mentioned here, the xenobots can walk, which I just showed you. They also swim, um, which we're not gonna talk about uh, because we don't have time. They do replicate, and we're gonna talk about kinematically self-replicating xenobots in the next lecture. Yeah? Okay, before we talk about kinematically self-replicating xenobots, I want to talk about a few follow-up experiments we did in this first attempt to cross the sim to real gap. Uh, our our long-suffering and good friend Doug, the microsurgeon, takes him about four hours to make one of these xenobots. And remember, they're a millimeter across. This is the most expensive animal on the planet, if we think about Doug's hourly rate and the equipment he needs to use to make one of these things. So once we'd collected data from the individual xenobots to prove sim to real, there was very good motivation for us to use these xenobots before they died to see what else they could do. So Doug took a bunch of them that he had and put them back into a dish to see what they would do together. And if you focus on the bottom half, the bottom half of this video for a moment, you'll notice a couple of interesting things. Remember, these are the xenobots that were evolved in hypernate to just act on their own. So they weren't really evolved to act in a group. What's going on? It's a lot of several things going on. They're latching on to one another. Other observations? Can you say that again? Ah, they know that there's another Xenobot close by and they're trying to go towards it. Yeah, they want to stick together and move as a group. I'll come back to that video. I want you to watch this individual physical xenobot in the bottom half. It seems interested in this small piece of debris lying on the bottom of the Petri dish. How is this possible? We didn't build any sensors into the robot, only motors, right? The myocardiac tissue. 
If you remember from our discussion about open and closed loop control, as far as we know, what the Xenobots are doing is open loop control, right? They just use their motors and that has some impact on their behavior, but they don't sense the repercussions of their actions. As far as we know, they don't sense anything at all. But this video and the other video I showed you and more videos we've collected since then, their behavior seems to suggest they are sensing things in their environment. How is that possible? Anybody take any cell biology classes? Ideas? I would say, like, uh, I guess the main way how does the actual resistance feels like moving, but I guess it can't feel the cell. Uh, it's, yeah, it, it may not be able to feel or sense. The, the amount, the amount of energy that you're like, using to move, it just changes the same. It's possible. It's a great observation. So as students of embodied cognition, there may be an explanation for what they're doing from a purely mechanical point of view, possibly. They bump into something and that compresses one side, side of their body, which causes them to sort of tilt or keel over, which causes them to start to describe a different trajectory. Maybe. We've been trying to rule that out for three years and we're still not quite sure yet. That's one possibility. There's another possibility. They act as if they're sensing and reacting to what they sense, but we didn't give them any sensors. And it's maybe not, the behavior is not, maybe not purely explainable from mechanical interactions. If you've ever taken a cell biology class, you spend a lot of time talking about what's on the surface of a cell, or what's on the surface of a cell. probably better to say what's not on the surface of a cell. There's everything you can imagine. One of the most common things on the surface of a cell is sensory receptors. So we're looking at a machine, a robot, an organism, a xenobot. We can argue about what we're looking at, but what we should all agree on is we're looking at something that's made from cells, and cells themselves are fantastically complicated machines. Cells sense the world around them. They take that information inside themselves, transform that information, and in the case of a lot of cells, what those cells do is a response to what they sense on their surface. So we didn't give the Xenobot sensors, but the things that we built the Xenobot from have tons of sensors. But we had no control over the type, the number, what they do. So, the organism as a whole, the xenobot as a whole, is open loop, but the parts, the cells that make up the xenobot are closed loop. We just didn't design that loop. Yeah? Okay. If you're confused, you're not alone. It's a little difficult to see in the bottom half of this video. It's a little bit easier to see in the top half. Uh, Sam, my PhD student, took the simulated xenobots, put them together, and then after having watched some of Doug's videos of the physical xenobots, saw that there was some small debris in the dish. So Sam put some small debris into the physics engine as well. And you'll notice that the xenobot, the simulated xenobots also temporarily link up or team up, and they end up pushing the cellular material around in the dish. Just an observation at this point. Yeah? Okay. Here's an example, uh, here's a scaled up version of this. In this experiment, Doug took a bunch of xenobots, which are the larger dark circles you see here, and sprinkled into the dish uh, very small glass pellets, which are dyed red, so you can see them, and sprinkled them across the bottom of the dish, so you get this pink surface. These red clumps, this is the movement, the result of the movement of all of these xenobots, and they happen to push a lot of these uh, glass beads into piles. Did they want to do that? Did they mean to do that? 
Was that just an unintended side effect of the fact that they, we'd evolved them to locomote? Still, to this day, unclear. OK. Last thing I want to show you, uh, we've got one minute left. OK, this is basic science. We can do this. It's now apparently a technology. What else can we get xenobots to do? How might they be useful in future? As I mentioned or showed you uh, a little while back, some of these, sorry, some of these xenobots have small holes in them, like this one here. And just for fun, Sam took a little small yellow pellet and put it inside the xenobot. And again, the xenobot wasn't evolved to do this, but it can be used or exploited for object transport. There is another branch of robotics uh, called intelligent, uh, intelligent drug delivery. And the idea in that field is to create very small robots that someday you may swallow or have injected into you. And those very small robots would navigate through the body to, for example, a cancerous tumor and deliver uh, a drug directly to the tumor. Sounds like science fiction. It is still science fiction, but people are making progress. Problem with intelligent drug delivery is if you make a very small robot out of metals and plastics, the one thing that the human body hates above all else is small amounts of metal and plastics in our bodies. Worst possible thing, one of the worst possible things you can do the human, human body. You can imagine there'd be a use to having robots deliver drugs directly to cancerous tumors. So maybe instead of building robots out of metals and plastics and ceramics, we'll make small robots out of living cells and introduce them into the human body. Human body probably also is not going to like frog cells being injected into the body. So next idea, don't put metal in, don't put frog cells in. Go ahead. Use the person's own cells, right? So possibly we can make these out of human cells and possibly out of the patient's own cells. And someday, not yet, uh, introduce them into the patient's own body, sidestep their immune response, and pave the way for these machines to do useful work inside the human body. Xenobots to be continued uh, on Thursday. I will talk about the final project then. You have your second to last quiz due tonight. See you Thursday. Thank you.